Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to another Lepada Leaders session. And this time we are looking at the Roaring Twenties and sort of considering are they going to roar or whimper? And I very much hope they're going to roar, uh, as hopefully my panellists will this morning. So um, what? Uh, before I go through the sort of the talking to you about who we've got this morning, um, just a little kind of couple of housekeeping things. You'll see at the bottom there is a questions and answers box, so please do pop any question into that um, and we will ask the panelists at the end unless it's something that's really relevant during I might kind of have a quick look during as well and then in the chat uh, function if there's anything you wish to post or also my colleague Gillian might post things resources to books or websites or um, to some of the things we talk about today so keep your eye on that as well um, so what I, I'm just delighted with my panel today, uh, the Cultural Commons has also helped us uh, bring together. So we have Helen Brocklebank, who many of you will know, CEO of Walpole, um, keeping our British luxury brands uh, at the fore uh, and certainly at the forefront of the government's mind some of the time. Um, so it's a delight uh, to have Helen here. Uh, we are, I'm just wondering, there's a bit of disturbance on the line and I'm wondering if I don't know what that, yeah, that sadly helped. Anyway, we, we will we'll, we'll deal with that as we come on. But um, it's uh, fair to say, so Walpole really is, protects um, the luxury sector and helps develop business. And it doesn't just look after the big people like Alexander McQueen and Burberry. They have fantastic schemes for some of the smaller entrepreneurial um, people who are coming up and they have a great mentoring program as well at Walpole that I've been part of. Um, and previous to that, Helen actually sort of earned her spurs in the world of publishing uh, with Harper's Bazaar um, and Esquire. And uh, her other role as well is she's quite involved with the Duke of Edinburgh Award charity, which probably has kept Helen a little busy recently as well. So we may hear some of that as we go on. And then we also have Michael Bonser with us, who uh, knows everything about the luxury hospitality sector, I think, from New York to London. Um, he started in the pier and Four Seasons in New York and then came to Claridge's. Uh, and uh, I think four or five years ago um, was brought on by Rosewood uh, Forbes Five Star Hotel to develop that and if you haven't been to the Rosewood Hotel in London uh, even for a drink or I'm sure we'll hear some of the things they're doing at the moment but it is a great uh, just beautifully designed um, and I'm sorry about the telephone ringing in the background and then last but not least we have Lucy Moise Ferreira who uh, is a writer and lecturer and researcher about fashion no less so um, she comes from the L London College of Fashion and also the University of Arts uh, has a PhD in fashion um, history and also studied history of art at Cambridge so she's uh, got the the whole kind of from the Pada from the art and and craft side right into um, the fashion so thank you so much all of you for joining us today um, and I thought what we might do is obviously we've got different questions to go through and some will be more relevant to each of you but I thought we might start with a sort of scene setting um, as to where we are to each of you now and I was going to start with Helen um, and really just with this sort of lockdown behind us what what are the consumer trends that you think we'll see that are emerging now? Well, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because we've had 14 months of really being able to think about this. <laughs> um, um, but um, the thing I would say is that a lot of the trends that we're seeing, and Michael will agree with me, are things that were there before. So we were having really big conversations about how does physical retail work with digital? You know, that's a, that's not a new conversation, but that's really that's accelerated enormously mm. over the last uh, 14, 15 months. We were having big conversations about how in a really global world do you make luxury feel special and really you know um hooked into its its place because of you know place is a really important part of the you know the, the high end thing where does something come from what can i you know can i get something i can't get anywhere else you know is it has it got that kind of rarity factor um and the kind of sense of what does beauty mean what does what does luxury really mean in a in a world where we you know we are very you know people have fortunately affluent um you know we've got a global affluent population 
what does it what does it mean in that context if you know what's special if everybody can have it so with that kind of context what's happened is that you we have uh, i think really kind of powered through some of the answers to those questions or at least refined those questions much much more so the trends are going to be um, with the kind of hyper acceleration of, of digital what you've got is a very very exciting store um, and and um, and kind of luxury experience emerging the importance of uh, being able to kind of touch and feel and be in an incredibly beautiful place that kind of multi-sensory experience after a year of just having just being able to see and hear people uh, has become more important than ever before I and mean, you only have to go to uh, michael's new uh pop-up with mccallan in the in, in the courtyard of the of the road of the rosewood or or to harris to see what they've done there in their new building to see how that elevation has happened. So the experience is really, is really important. The fun and the beauty are things that are going to be unbelievably important. Why is it gorgeous? Why is this something, you know, what's the, in a world of non, you know, where only essential shopping was, was possible, how dreary. Um, what does non-essential, I mean, we love non-essential things, like I'm worth it, I, what, you know, what does that look like? So you've got this elevation of luxury too. So the things that are very rare and can't be owned by absolutely everybody um, and are super special and are only, you know, perhaps made in very limited quantities or the table that you can't, you can only get at midnight. <laughs> um, these things become very, you know, very important. How do I feel special and how do I reward myself? Um, and actually at the other end, you've got a, a kind of a big, a kind of a, a expanding premium end. So what's the bit of luxury can I have, you know, that everybody can have? So you've got Ricardo Tishi doing, um, a very cool drop of a, quite an inexpensive t-shirt, say, for Burberry. But at the other end, you've got a handmade trench coat that is made exclusively from you, from Vicuna on the inside and all that all that kind of stuff. So, um, and then you've got hyper-localization where it's, there is, I have to go to this one, this one place because nothing will be, of, you know, I can't, I won't be able to get that in, I don't know, Gucci in Shanghai. I'll only be able to get it in Gucci in, uh, Gucci Garden in Florence, or it will only be available in um, Burberry in you know on on kind of on Regent Street. I mean those you know those things. What's the connection to place? And then the last thing I'll uh, I'll talk about before passing uh, passing back to you is sustainability. So uh, beauty and specialness and rarity and all those gorgeous things and experience, but it has to have purpose. It can't be at the expense of other people. So that is that has i think come forward probably six or seven years in a single in a single year that uh move of the sector to become um to make sure there is no impact on planet or people and that it is a force for good so they would be my my key trends thank you and um to you uh michael and maybe starting with the answering to to the force for good and sustainability how does that work in the luxury sector and, and what uh, consumer trends are, are you anticipating? Yeah, I mean, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we've stayed open actually since last September. So we saw that glimpse of what the trends look like for hospitality back in September and October when, you know, we actually were allowed at that point to sort of be out and about and, and in the hotel for any reason. And then obviously we went to several lockdowns, but we continued to stay open throughout all of that uh, for those who you know, could travel. Um, and what we saw uh, and what we are still seeing and what we continue to see is that um, our clients are uh, staying longer. They're planning more in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're leading less to chance. So kind of itineraries are sort of planned, um, you know, pre-arrival, way more so than they have before. And they're actually basing themselves on property for longer. So as uh, the operator, we now need to offer more on property. I almost feel like the hotels now, like, like this mini resort in mm -hmm. the city, um, you know, so, and it's really unprecedented, the levels that we see um, of activity in the hotel right now, you know, I mean, we've accepted, I think, almost now 14,000 reservations for fresco dining. And actually, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, um, how we didn't have enough al fresco 
um, options in London, I don't think. I mean, our yeah, summer yeah. isn't that terrible. Uh, you know, I'm from Inverness, Scotland, so I know what bad weather can be. <laughs> and London has pretty decent weather. We should have been much more al fresco to begin with. Like all these terraces should have existed in the first place. Yeah. So, you know, and I think that's going to continue all throughout, uh, hopefully for the rest of the year. I mean, if we can, we'll try and keep as much of that al fresco in place. Wellness as well, health and wellness. I mean, yes, we've all needed to get our eyebrows done and, and our nails attended to and a few other bits and pieces. So, you know, once we get that sort of maintenance out of the way, you know, we've actually paired up now uh, with Katie Miller and Anne Boniface, uh, who have this amazing series called Una series, which is all about, um, yes, there's like yoga and Pilates and so forth, but it's also about sleeping better and mindfulness and mental health. Uh, because, you know, we've all been affected somewhat. I had a very bad January. I was doing quite well until January. And then January was a bad month for me where there was, uh, there was kind of quite a few uh, liquid deliveries uh, to my home. Um, and, you know, it was like the weather, you know, kind of all got us down. But, you know, the last year has affected all of us very differently. So, um, and that we see, you know, we see our clients now asking for that, the reservation stage. Um, and booking spa appointments at the time of booking the room reservations, so and restaurant reservations. So there's a lot more uh, getting booked into the property. Um, and now it's going to be about those immersive experiences. So, you know, Helen mentioned our McAllen Terrace in the courtyard. I mean, it really feels like, you know, you're surrounded with gorgeous tartan throws and heather. And uh, we actually have the scent, this peaty scent sort of wafting through the space as well. Because at one point when we were designing this, uh, we thought, oh, my, you know, we might not even be able to get up to Scotland, uh, you know, and let alone start to get on a plane and go elsewhere. So, you know, let's try and recreate a bit of that in the centre of London. Um, so, and then we've got all these lovely masterclasses, you can do pie masterclasses and learn about gin and all these other things that people are signing. I mean, a lot of these classes are sold out through the summer already, you know, we just can't wait. So. Yeah, and I, th I think it's interesting, the sort of multi-sensory that, that Helen mentioned and you picked up on is, is the is texture, feel, and also smell. That, yeah. we're, you know, we're, we've been around in our own little silos and you kind of stop smelling yourself, probably a good thing. But actually that kind of wonderful thing about walking past, a, you know, wonderful sort of perfume shop or something, just it, it's just sort of wonderful. Yeah. So I, I, I totally get that. So over onto Lucy, I'm just thinking, you know, we've, we, we're taking off the yoga pants and the sweatshirt, possibly. We want to put our lovely dress on, just thinking about consumer trends, but I'm thinking we probably need to layer it up for a little while if we all want to you know, enjoy our life to the full outside. So what are you seeing as the sort of fashion consumer trends coming out at the moment? That's right. I mean, hi, everybody. <laughs> and yeah, I think there is a pull in two different, quite opposite directions, because fashion does have this such a central relationship with us, our body, how we feel, how we interact with the world. It is literally the physical boundary between our skin and the outside and the public, which is not something we've been sort of dealing with so much over the past year. We've been very much sort of inside, kind of dealing with our own sort of private realms. So sort of going out can feel quite daunting and fashion can play a role in kind of helping us to navigate that. So I think on one end of the spectrum, we have been kind of used to living in more comfortable clothing, this kind of seeking coziness. And in terms of consumer trends, there has been sort of a push of things like athleisure. It was already a trend before, but I think COVID, as Helen mentioned, it has been a catalyst. It has sped up a lot of these trends. So I think athleisure, sort of comfort wear, that is going to continue and it will be sort of pursued by luxury brands and consumers and thinking, how can we elevate that and sort of make it more special, more luxurious, more tactile, thinking about how sort of um, materials feel on the skin. And in some ways, this can also be sort of quite comforting psychologically. It is this barrier. We can feel cocooned. We feel safe. 
But on the other hand, there is the sort of change, the shift in energy and people are excited and people do want to celebrate and walking around. You can kind of sense that in the air and you sort of see people starting to gather again in parks outside, which is brilliant. So there is this idea of sort of wanting to express that through fashion as well and kind of have that sense of decadence. I mean, thinking back to the 1920s, we all know that the flapper dresses and how exciting and exhilarating that was, how the sort of clothing would move in a dance hall, thinking about sort of the different trends, the rising hemlines, exposing more skin. So very, very exciting. But again, um, with things like the war and also the flu pandemic in 1918, again, they sort of acted as catalysts the roaring 20s weren't completely new it was just kind of sped up from trends that were already starting to develop beforehand and I think we're seeing something very similar today as well I, I, yeah really interesting thank you and it's just just how it sort of polarizes from one side to the other and I think exactly. that actually just sort of from our perspective and looking at the art and antiques and interiors you're seeing that a lot as well because people are sort of been in their own silos and and there's this explosion of color and pattern and wallpapers um which is it's quite interesting watching it so um i think what's quite interesting as well and certainly i've been seeing this in some of of uh, the work i've been doing and and maybe it is related little to the hyper acceleration of digital that um helen mentioned um but what are the opportunities do you think that that we've seen through the pandemic and and starting with you helen i think it'd be quite interesting to look at where people have actually developed and taken advantage of of this sort of strange situation we found ourselves in well i think it's been really interesting to see how um how brands particularly have communicated with their customers so there was that whole period of, you know a year ago where you you couldn't transact i mean it just would have felt even if you even if you kind of could have done because your digital things thing was so slick it would have felt so wrong wouldn't it at the mm. beginning of this awful i mean this awful tragedy to to kind of go how are you feeling um and would you like this top yeah. <laughs> just that was sort of wrongness would have been awful i mean i think everybody you know and i think everybody felt like that so yeah well, but what that meant was that when you're but you wanted to reach out and talk to people and I in brands felt like that too and so you had um a really different focus on the on how you were doing that so you might you know you'd segment your audience you would do you know you would talk to your top very top customers that you knew very very well you know the the management director of the CA would pick up the telephone you might send an extraordinary kind of uh, box of uh, you know kind of a of, um a kind of you know food or something to to make at home i mean i think you know, i think that might be something that you that you did rose at the rosewood certainly it was something i'd seen from kind of brands and carriages too um but then the but the emphasis on the communication was was all about how do i how do i feel and how do i care about you mm. and actually in luxury that relationship is absolutely central it's how do i how do i care luxury is not a transactional business it's a it's a love affair it's a lifetime marriage at, at best you know it's a it's a it's a romance you want to conjure that feeling of um of kind of you know of a, of a dialogue and of a two-way relationship um so what happened is you started to see much more uh the people in the business put on you know put on uh on the on on show on social media and things like that so that was very uh, that was very important that was kind of that's a new thing so luxury mm -hmm. has historically been very kind of you know arm's length don't you know i'm going to tell you what i'm thinking here's the handbag that's enough of our conversation it's amazing and then it became very human i think so um you saw uh the you know the person that the farmer that was growing the uh the grain that yeah. went into the whiskey in the distillery you saw you know the, the person in the hotel who was making you know the hanging the housekeeper who was kind of making um making the beds or kind of you know or the the people who were making the meals that were then going to um uh the kind of you know, to, to feed the nhs in the case of the barclay hotel for you know for example so you start to see the maker and then uh, as things have evolved that very personal very intimate relationship that was kind of always there has become even more uh even more you know even more so it's become a real dialogue between customer and maker and brand 
And I think it's brought everybody closer. I mean, here we are in our own homes, aren't we, talking? And I think that that's a new thing for for a for a luxury brand to to, to kind of do, to kind of you know, my home to your home. And so I think that intimacy is really built on what luxury is all about. Um, and that, you know, that kind of sense of the of emotion. Um, yes, is that something yeah. that you've Yeah, no, I, I yeah, and, and just over to you. I mean, I, I was just going to pick up, I think it's something that's been very interesting looking at the the um, art galleries. Certainly part of it is because they're not able to do all these fairs and stuff, but actually how they've developed the relationships with their current customers has been really interesting. And I think that's interesting seeing how that's happened um, in yeah in the luxury and hospitality sector as well. But Michael, ha yeah, what, what opportunities have you spotted? from yeah i mean initially i think there was yeah this i i remember back in february last year when i was asked by somebody in the town hall meeting one of our members of staff will the hotel close you know is there a possibility of the hotel closing and uh, i of course was like absolutely not that would be insane and then so a few weeks later we were closed but um i think initially then we're all a bit shocked uh but we kind of got on to virtual virtual communication and what we were doing with our, our associates immediately were actually talking to them and communicating with them as uh, uh, the most we ever had, you know, and over communicating and being really transparent with them and, you know, getting to actually know um, our team, I think, and closer, you know, we were all sort of bonding together much closer. Then we sort of went into the community and we were sort of giving back to the NHS, cooking meals, delivering uh, food, uh, food parcels, um, you know, delivering sort of nice things to families that were um, sort of stuck in London visiting sort of sick relatives and things like that. And that really brought all of us together, you know, in a, a great deal too. And so many people volunteer their own time as well. And then it kind of moved into that next phase about what are our clients doing? You know, what can we now do with our clients? And to what Helen just said as well, you know, all of a sudden I'm talking with clients in my home. Uh, I'm, out, I'm today in the office, but, you know, which was so unusual. And we were actually managing to connect with clients who have incredibly, you know, high powered, um, you know, very time short lives. But you know what? We all of a sudden had an hour to chat on, you know, Zoom, which, you know, we can barely see each other in the lobby in a normal day for two seconds, you know, or I miss them on check-in or I miss them on check-out and then we've got to yeah. wait another week. So all of a sudden you're getting to know your clients a lot more. And I must say the staff, uh, you know, such as the bartenders, um, you know, especially the bartenders and the chefs all got on board and starting just honing their skills, you know, so they were hosting online cocktail classes. You were getting insight into their personal lives, um, you know, and I actually have taken a lot from this because Yes, you know, we're actually on social media quite a lot talking to our, um, our clients. Um, and yes, and you can post a, a cocktail being made and you can post, you know, a, a beautiful uh, a dish. But actually, when we were posting content, you know, if, you know, if one of us is on camera actually passionately talking about the, our product or our service or the hotel, we were getting thousands thousands of more views on that, you know, um, and all of a sudden we're like, well, yeah, we're a people industry and actually people want to hear from people and see people and hear from you. Um, and I think also what it's done for the business is I've never understood my business better than I do today. You know, we were forced to diversify. So when we stayed open from September, you know, the business that could travel, production, filming, shooting, uh, photo shoots, all of that. I mean, I know more location scouts now than I do, I don't know, whatever, uh, alcoholic brands. I mean, you know, and we're just about to do another huge filming in two weeks' time, right before we open for a major TV show. Are we show. allowed, to, are so we allowed to know? Well, there's a French version of it right now that we're all quite addicted to. Uh, and this will be the British version with no subtitles. And there's a fashion element. To it there's an okay. entertainment to it so very excited about that, that so um, <laughs> but all of a sudden you know we have this whole new market 
that we weren't exposed to before. Yeah. We've got to know, you know, the corporate client has kind of stayed at home a bit right now. We've got more leisure guests, you know, so we've got to know more of them. Uh, so I actually think when business is back, uh, we're going to be busier than ever because yeah. we've, we're now talking to all these different markets, you know, mm. that we weren't before. And yeah, and that sort of that ability to pivot and find new markets, but still be in touch and, and you know, keep that relationship with your current customers or your clients and build yeah. that is fantastic. Well, Just so, to, oh, I was going to say, it's so interesting, isn't it? How um, the opportunities that you thought might be there. I mean, you know, we talked a lot about pivoting at the beginning. Um, the covers uh, are, 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 you know, are, have been huge. I and mean, we've got to hang on to that. But the most important thing I think we've all learned that is uh, a lesson, but also the big opportunity is this, exactly as Michael's saying, it's, you know, luxury is about being human, isn't it? Yeah. And this is, it's taught us above all the importance of how to be together when we're all apart. And actually, you know, mostly in business, we are all apart. So, but you can still bring, still bring people together and how to care when you can't, you can't reach somebody yeah. physically. Um, and I think that's going to be a really big lesson going forward that we must not forget because it's at the heart of everything that is the opportunity of recovery. Mm. Uh, very good. I, I think we need to kind of just, you know, cut that and share that message, but I totally agree. And um, just sort of moving to you, Lucy, and it was one of the things I was thinking about as we're having these conversations is actually how is that intimacy um, translated into the fashion world? If we have been in people's homes, how have those kind of the the front row, you know, is now virtual in terms of fashion shows and everything. How, how has the fashion industry coped with this in terms of making themselves human and, and, you know, bridging the divide, let's say? Of course, that's absolutely right. And I agree with both of you. There has been the sort of huge sense of intimacy we're finding. We're all sort of inside each other's homes for really the first time often. We're thinking about this on a large brand scale. And of course, this has completely sort of accelerated changes going on in terms of fashion dissemination and, for example, runway shows. I mean, there have been digital shows before many times, but now it really feels like the landscape has completely opened up. I mean, sort of going back through history, I mean, we've had fashion film for over 100 years. Surprisingly, we went to the cinema in the 1920s. You would see before your feature film, a fashion film kind of telling you what the latest trends were and what to look out for. So that's sort of one side of it. But, you know, 100 years later, you do get sort of fashion film being used within runway shows as sort of a live audience and possibly using video content on the actual stage or an installation. Um, but now we're more and more sort of inviting audiences to actually visit these shows from their own homes, using their own devices, their own computers. And this really has sort of opened up opportunities for creativity and sort of disseminating fashion in new ways. So for example, how do we kind of create that sense of intimacy and tactility? So designers have approached that in different ways. I think a really good example is JW Anderson, the show in the box concept. Um, they've done that a few times now, but sort of sending audience members, fashion editors, an actual box containing physical, tangible items that kind of relate to the show, almost like a mini exhibition to kind of give that sense of intimacy. So sort of bringing the audience there, sort of even if it's not physically together, they're kind of experiencing those tactile elements. Um, another really interesting example is Moschino, who recently used dolls, sort of marionettes that were sort of manipulated to create a catwalk show, which again is really interesting because it picks up on sort of things that have been done in history out of necessities, sort of looking back hundreds of years, that's often what would happen in place of what we now have as the runway show. Designers would send out sort of small dolls and kind of smaller versions of their clothing. It's also been sort of a tool used by designers, someone like Madeleine Vionne working in the 1930s, using a doll to sort of develop her craft. And then we see now sort of Moschino actually taking that forward and sort of exploding it really, creating an entire catwalk show, including audience members. So you can even pick out certain characters like Anna Wintour sort of characterized in the show and everything's miniaturized. So it's quite that. exciting. I think it really has opened up to a lot of scope to have fun with fashion and find new ways to kind of communicate it. And do you think that we'll kind of move away a little bit from that sort of seasonal conveyor belt in needing to sort of have, you know, four, 
seasons coming out and that people have a little bit more time to create or, or do you think we'll move back yeah. to that quickly? I think absolutely there is a push to sort of really slow down fashion. I mean, our lives over the past year have been sort of forced to slow down by necessity. And I think that is really important. I think sort of you've both, Michael and Helen, already touched on this idea of sustainability and how we've been considering it for years. But right now it just seems more important than ever. We've had this time to kind of stop, think, reflect, mm -hmm. slow down. So I think fashion will become slower. Um, by necessity and you know, brands are thinking you know, is there this need for the typical defined collections and I think you know it's becoming more important to produce a collection not just for the sake of it because the new season is due but because there is a development sort of an, an act to be kind of shown and displayed so I think there will be kind of a move away from those traditional categorizations and yeah. I think fashion will become a little bit more fluid, a little bit more open. And we're also seeing that in terms of sort of genderized collections and a lot of brands are becoming gender neutral. So why do we have to divide it into women's wear and men's wear, for example? So it gives us an opportunity to kind of reshape things according to society, how it is now. Yeah, I, I mean, even in children's wear, I know some shops are changing it there, which is, yeah, a relief because it makes no sense some of the divisions Absolutely. between some of the clothes at all. Absolutely, and it's only been done fairly recently. Looking back, babies were all dressed the same. They'd all have a white <laughs> dress, for example. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Really interesting. And um, Michael, back to you. In the, I mean, you're clearly Rosewood is flourishing in these sort of strange times. But actually, when I listen to quite a lot of other hotels talking about their bookings um, at you know, the, the percentage of international bookings uh, for them are obviously slowed down considerably and things are uh, changing perhaps in terms of some of the local audience, but how important is it going to be to the lifeblood of the hospitality sector to get borders open again uh, in terms of central London really? And yeah, people. absolutely. I mean, we, you know, there's just not enough Brits to go around uh, to sort of, you know, fill up all London hotels, especially. And, you know, we've been um, talking to a lot of our clients just in the last few weeks. You know, every, everyone's first trip is out to the country, out to the coast, up to Scotland. You know, it's mm. the city trip isn't exactly on everyone's number mm. one destination initially. And I think London didn't really recognize that the first time around. Uh, so we've had, you know, the, um, we've had, a little bit of confidence uh, from the mayor's office and from London and partners and other and other partners, Visit Britain and so forth, to really focus in on London and make sure the message is very strong about London safe, everything is reopened. Um, there's this, you know, there's X festivals planned through the summer to attract people in because London occupancy was the last occupancy to come back when it came to sort of hospitality last year. So. But I must say, you know, 45%, 40, 45% of my clients are American. Um, then, you know, sort of European, Asia, sort of domestic after that. So the New York Times came out with an article over uh, the last weekend that they sort of foresaw uh, American travel happening end of May, early June. And I must say, you know, not that that's sort of legally been announced, and Boris hasn't got up yet to tell us what we're going to going to do or not to do but the new york times seemingly was taken as gospel because we probably received a couple hundred thousand pounds worth of bookings from american clients between saturday afternoon and yesterday evening so Amazing. um yeah i need to uh need to write a thank you note to the uh the, new york times yeah but, the power um, of press but our our american clients are absolutely desperate you know and thank you know thank god their vaccination a program, you know, all, all of a sudden shot out of nowhere. And actually, most friends I speak to in New York have at least had one, if not both, vaccinations already, um, of, and sort of all different age groups. So um, I think, uh, yeah, the consumer confidence, I would say, over the last uh, seven days has taken a dramatic turn. And over the last two days, we've had about 15 calls with Middle Eastern um, so royal families uh, directly with the sheikhs or princes themselves um, or sheikhahs and with some of the family offices. And although there are a few issues to iron out with that group, um, as far as um, their, um, their restrictions, 
they're really hoping for a sort of end of Ramadan, end of May, early June uh, to start arriving back into London too. So honestly, these conversations we're having right now, <laughs> I thought wouldn't be happening until sort of September. Uh, so I feel like we're a quarter ahead of ourselves. I mean, we're mm -hmm. at least, you know, sort of three months ahead of schedule in my head. Um, and it's, I think it's really encouraging. I think honestly, it's going to pop. And I mean, there was some article yesterday, you know, the hospitality industry is going to have to literally recruit sort of 350,000 jobs over the next sort of month, two months. And are those people still here? Yeah. Question yeah. mark. <laughs> Question mark. Yeah, we will find. Um, on to you, Helen, because I, I, I think I'm sure you can pick up on that. And I also wanted you to pick up on your point about globalization and hyperlocalization. But um, yeah, so I think, I mean, it's, um, I think as what luxury is an ecosystem and particularly in, you know, in London. So what Michael is saying about the early bookings or, you know, or bookings starting to come back for uh, end of May, beginning of June, rather than September, which I think is when we were all thinking about it, is absolute music to my ears. Because then I think immediately Savile Row, which is a sector which is so important to the whole experience of sector and absolutely place that point of hyper localization. You can only get a proper bespoke Savile Row made, tailor made suit on, you know, by what, you know, in, in that place. Um, that relationship between, because, and it's American customers and Middle Eastern customers that have that unique association. So once the travel's there and the hotels are full and having an incredible experience, well, actually, something like Savile Row becomes alive again. So I can tell my members of Savile Row, look, that you know, you, you have a really unique opportunity here to get ready for that moment because it's coming. Talk to your customers; they're booking at the Rosewood. Um, let's let's get that up. And then, for, as an organisation, we um, we we start thinking of uh, what is it that makes the UK really really unique you know we've got a, you know we talk in general terms about incredible creativity and beautiful and a kind of that um confluence of of heritage and history but modernity and coolness you know kind of simultaneously um kind of palaces and punk rockers i mean that you know the carnaby street and blenheim palace i mean those are kind of slightly old traits but that you know london and, and the uk um how do we but how do we talk in really specific terms now as a part of the recovery to um, both ourselves in the UK and then the rest of the world about the things that we only we can only get here? And I think antiques fits really well into that. So we are starting to talk about what you know the um, uh, I mean Savile Road, the uh, the whiskey industry, which is kind of the Swiss watch. <laughs> what you know what the Swiss watch industry is to uh, Switzerland it is to the UK. So, you know, that's got a, such a sense of provenance, the, um, the kind of cashmeres, the trench coats, the uh, shoes, the palaces, things like Goodwood uh, and Glyndebourne, are those really special things. So putting the emphasis on what, what is completely unique. And that's a pragmatic thing, because if we don't get the international visitors here, then that, then our, you know, the industries don't really, don't really thrive. And that goes also for, I mean, things like Masterpiece or your, incredible Lepada antiques uh, affair you need that international customer to come back so we've got a job to do to go you can't get it anywhere else it's unique it's distinctive it's fabulous it's going to make you feel amazing and it's a whole system stay in the best place wear the best suit buy the most incredible uh, clock or, or painting i mean you know those things are great so yeah. uh, we've got a big communications job to do right now and then accelerate out the starting gate of the kind of the visit London and um, um I I think it, it's actually very interesting am I on mute no no um just that that whole kind of the ecosystem as you mentioned in terms of sort of art and antiques the provenance and also the auction houses the the I mean the hospital the hotels the restaurants it's such a part of a, a kind of circle where we're all together and the sort of walking between Bond Street past all the right shops to get to any of those 
those elements and whether you're, in, you're visiting a fair or not. I think on a slightly less, I mean, away from COVID, but one thing that is challenging in our world as well is not just the international travel, um, but it's also the new Brexit restrictions. And I'm sure that's the same in terms of fashion, uh, in terms of luxury materials crossing that we've, you know, we've got that other impediment that is slowing things down at the moment as well that we need to, um, you know, find ways around quicker than we have. We're getting there, but I think logistics are suddenly the most important business uh, for most of us <laughs> to get things backwards and forwards. And I'm sure it's the same food and wine uh, and everything else. Um, one of the other things I wanted to pick up on um, was this uh, sustainability question, because obviously we saw a lot of uh, conversations around sustainability in uh, luxury, looking at what Mulberry, I, I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, Helen, but I feel like Mulberry have done a 360 in the sense that when I grew up and my mother had a Mulberry handbag, it was for life. And you had it, you know, you went in, you had it mended and it was sold to you as this is for life. And then suddenly, when I was of an age where I could buy a Mulberry handbag, they were sort of telling me that I should get a different one every season. And now I feel like they've gone back to their roots that there are very fashionable, interesting handbags there, but actually they really want you to look after and go back to the to the shop. And I, I, I it's interesting. And all of these messages were coming through before COVID. And I wonder whether they're going to come out the other way quite so much in that sort of quest for sustainability. Uh, Who would you like to take? Do you want me to speak to that one, or do you, or would you like Lucy to? Sorry, um, you start, start start with you, Helen. Then we'll go to Lucy and then Michael. <laughs> uh, so I mean, uh, there's there's uh, there's two things I want to say say there. Firstly, the big picture is that actually, from our point of view, luxury has to have a you know. The, the only luxury is a clean conscience. You know, if you are a brand that has been like Lock and Co Hatters around since 1676, then you're, you know, as the still family owner of that business, you don't want the planet to go to hell on your watch, do you? <laughs> you know, you want it to be around, you know, around another 300 years. So you've got to have that responsibility. And I think it always, always has had it has just not done a good job, perhaps, of talking about it. The emphasis culturally has not been on that. So Mulberry is an interesting case in point because they have had for 35 years of their 50 years in business a, um, a really sizable archive at the factory uh, manufacturing facility, I should say, because that's that's posh for that's luxury for factory manufacturing facility. Um, they've had this archive of, um, of all the leathers, you know, the kind of the exotics, the hardware, so you could always take your handbag back that you loved. You know, you might have had 10 handbags that you really loved. I mean, it doesn't, you know, for every every outfit, but you would take be able to get them repaired by Mulberry. But the, it has only been recently that the emphasis of the communication is like, oh my God, we should start to tell people this stuff. Why haven't we been doing that? You know, you've all at Johnson's of Elgin, you've always been able to send your cashmere polo back to them to get um to get the moth hole repaired which since the London moth bastards have eaten pretty much everything I own is it's really good to know. Um, so those, you know, I think it's, I think it's that. And, I'm, and actually there's, um, I mean, there's Hermes says uh, that luxury is that which can be repaired. So I think there is a durability and preciousness of luxury. I think it's right to buy less, buy better. I think we have come through, um, a, you know, kind of a big consumer boom where buying absolutely everything all the time and having something you know, I must have new <laughs> has made us feel a bit overloaded. And I, you know, and I, and I think um, don't buy 75 things from, um, from Zara, much as I love Zara, buy one amazing thing that costs the same as those 75 things, but it's going to last me forever. You know, that um, I want something that I can pass to my daughter that, you know, that, uh, and I, then you see lots of new businesses like the restory springing up who, who speaks to that kind of repair repair thing and i do think that's the essence of luxury sustainability is as much about luxury as craftsmanship has ever been and i think thinking about the audience on this call that puts the antiques um and collectible industry in a really really good place because that messaging is more important than it ever has been yeah. and there's perhaps right. a collaboration there too around uh, around the kind of repair and recycle 
parts of it. There are skills there that exist in the antiques sector that luxury brands can want access to. Yeah, and I, I actually think also that luxury brands keep alive some of this because some of the areas of specialization of let's, let's say enameling or you know some of those important things that are, are or very valuable things that are sold actually it's the watch industry who are keeping the enamel enamelers going so it's quite interesting how how they do actually coexist um, very well um, Michael to you in I mean just thinking about sustainability perhaps some of it's around worth and food and drink comes from is one element but it's quite hard to be sustainable at, in a hotel I think some of the time in terms of the turnover of laundry and um, international travel and everything else so how do you earn your spurs in that yeah yeah it's interesting I was talking earlier about how we use this time to look at how we can diversify our client why the issue with my life and all of everyone in hospitality is that you never have enough time you know you sort of run you go you work through a thousand tasks every day and you kind of get home you don't really know what you've been through for the last 12 hours you sort of slump in a chair and you think what happened today so we never have enough spare time in our on our hands and what we have had a bit is spare time so to really look at everything that we do and initially when we went into this last year we were all of a sudden getting quite quickly obsessed with sort of sealing everything, covering everything in plastic. Like how are people going to, you know, sanitization, how are people going to be able to use a hotel room and come back? And we were thinking to ourselves, well, the last thing we want to do here is now start covering everything in plastic and sealing everything and making everything sort of, um, you know, that sort of sterile sort of, mm -hmm. so sort of thinking around that. So we've actually used the time now to, finally eliminate all those little plastic bottles in the bathroom and getting back, you know, to the sink, eliminating all that single use plastic, taking out all the water bottles throughout the building, changing all of that, um, you know, looking at so many other bits and pieces um, throughout the business and using the time. Um, forming a family committee that uh, do a lot of community work now, um, a lot of charity work, um, giving back to um, uh, local NHS hospitals, uh, lots of different things. So, I mean, they have about 30, 40, 50 different activities that they're sort of all putting together right uh, yeah. now and doing. Um, we've also, you know, used the time um, to acquire new properties as well. Um, and uh, especially in Europe, um, they're all older properties. So we're now looking at the sort of the restoration of these beautiful buildings within Europe, um, Madrid, Munich, Vienna, uh, Venice, um, you know, uh, and uh, looking at how we can, uh, the sustainability of those products and projects are incredibly important. In fact, our new property in Grosvenor Square will lead the way in sustainability uh, for hotels, period, in the country. So, um, which is obviously very, very important. So I think even at a hotel level and at a corporate level, sustainability has been um, really important in how we move the company forward. Um, and, you know, the company have now issued uh, sort of lots of goals for us to all meet um, globally at every property. Um, and uh, I think that's what it's given us, right? It's just given us time to sort of reflect, become a better business, better people. Uh, and uh, because we'll never probably have that time again. Well, let's hope we don't have that time again in a way uh, and actually all get back to business. Yeah. But uh, that valuable time has been given to us. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to sort of getting all that up and running. I think one of the things just uh, to, to comment is I think with Rosewood is you're you're well known for some of your fantastic art collections that are curated as well, but I'm sure many of our members can help you use sustainable reused wonderful antiques in your older properties across Europe. We would sure love we can that. Help furnish. <laughs> um, Lucy, uh, to you in terms of looking at the sort of fashion, of, I, I know there has been lots of chat about fast fashion and sustainability, and sometimes it seems to come from a very um, uh, real place and sometimes a little greenwashing. Um, but where, what do you think the fashion world has learned this year in terms of uh, sustainability? I suppose one of the things we talked about is maybe slowing down. So therefore, you are making things that are to last and uh, less trend related, but. 
Of course. I mean, the pandemic has really shone light on a whole range of issues, social, environmental issues, and we're sort of really thinking about that as a society. And we can't enjoy fashion if we know there has been some suffering to human, animal, and environmental that has gone into the production of that. Mm -hmm. And so there are brands who are really creating some innovative ways to sort of combat that. And I think also um, the pandemic has really shown us how important nature is. You know, the outdoors has really been uh, escapes of rules of stuck inside, but enjoying gardens and parks and the fresh air, you know, we can't be without that. So we've kind of realized how crucial it is. And I think that has actually come through in terms of fashion design. Recent collections have been very inspired by the outdoors, nature. We see that in prints and in color palettes. And, you know, it's also the fact that fashion has this huge role to play in sustainability. And we're not just sort of thinking, how can fashion sort of have a lesser impact on the environment, but brands are now starting to think, how can fashion positively affect our world and the environment? What can we do to sort of actively make things better? So not just sort of leave them alone or sort of keep them neutral, but actually be a force for good and for change. So you have some startups, for example, using things like algae within their clothing that can even do things like photosynthesize, actually improving our air quality and our environment. So it really shows how important and how exciting fashion can be and the sort of really big role that it plays within that. Of course, I, lo I, I love that. I, I wanted an algae jacket. I mean, that is fabulous. Um, and just before we open it to questions, just start ending with the final question, which I think was something you talked about, Helen. So um, forgive me for batting it back to you all. But um, five years time, what trends are going to stick and what, what are we going to lose? Stick or twist? <laughs> uh, that's so interesting. I think you'll see... Um, You'll see the uh, the store or the physical experience in in luxury becoming a, a kind of you know a, a, an extraordinary opulent palace, which not that many people will be able to go into. But when you're in, it will be like all of your I don't know somewhere between the the V and A and and Glyndebourne and the Rosewood all combined together, but with things you can buy. I think it's going. I think that the uh, the specialness of that, the beauty of that, is going to be really. Uh, really interesting but at the same time the acceleration of digital is going to be really going to just continue I think that pace of change is going to be uh, is going to be interesting but I think the more things change the more they stay the same so that idea of um, of beauty and preciousness and uh, uniqueness is going to kind of get stay and get get more and you know kind of more and more um, I think we'll also see um, um, I hope <laughs> that we'll see a huge focus on um, sustained focus on what we're doing with sustainability and also about how does that play with the customer so brands are doing a lot um, the, the legislative framework is quite is quite interesting but the consumer needs to kind of come and put their money where their mouth is um, and I think and I think kind of take responsibility for that drive and brands have to help you know how do I get rid of the packaging that all my stuff on the internet's come back with? You know, how do I understand that actually getting something delivered to me is possibly a bigger environmental uh, hazard than me tootling off on the tube to the shops to go myself? So, so I think those things. But 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 beauty and joy and um, and you know and kind of experience are going to be the things in five years' time that we will love and relish. I love that. And and Lucy, to, to you, what it, what's your thoughts? Oh, I really think that fashion sort of social conscience is here to stay and it's only going to deepen. It's only something that brands and consumers are going to be pursuing sort of in even more detail and trying to take even further. And also on a practical level, I think masks are something that are unlikely to go away entirely. I think they will stick around. I mean, they were already sort of widely adopted elsewhere, sort of in Asian countries for quite a few years now, for example. And people have got into that habit. And you do think sort of maybe it does serve a practical function, sort of even outside of a pandemic, for example. And we see sort of brands sort of engaging with that and even sort of finding different styles. How can we make a mask luxurious? How can we differentiate that? So I think that's something that is going to stay as well, perhaps to a lesser degree, but it's not going to go away entirely. 
it's another way of showing our personality, isn't it? By That's the marks right. we exactly. choose. Although I do, I find it, I, for people who are hard of hearing, it's so difficult watching how they, mm -hmm. we need to find something that isn't just something that's like a spittle shield uh, for those <laughs> who need to be able to lip read. Um, and Michael, what about you in terms of what trends do you think are gonna stick and what's, what's gonna go? Yeah, I mean, sustainability, absolutely, for sure. I think we were always in the hospitality, in the luxury hospitality sector, we were always saying, ah, we can't do that. It's not luxury. Oh, we can, you know, you can't not, not say the sheets are changed every day or even again on turndown, like some hotels are, you know, twice a day, you know, and, but you can't say that you might do otherwise. It's not luxury. That person's spending eight, nine hundred pounds a night for that hotel and you need to offer those services. Um, you can't not package, you know, that that delivery in a certain way. You can't not have layers of tissue paper and packaging because it's not luxury. But actually, when you unpack that box now and you're tossing all that stuff onto the floor, you, I mean, most of us are thinking yeah. that feels a little wrong. So we actually now, you know, and I think we've all woken up a bit in luxury to say, you can't say that now. We've got to get, you know, we've got to get onto this and, and move this forward now. And it's really taught us that. So that's definitely going to be something we're constantly looking at. But I also think what we saw over the past year is this, a hotel's not just this 24 hour experience where you just get a room and stay. And actually our clients are reaching out, you know, to ask us, you know, could you, um, do, do you have a cleaning service? Could we have some, you know, could you have your hotel cleaners come over to our house? You know, we're actually doing a dinner party at home because we're not going out you know, could, you know, one of your chefs come over? Could we have a bartender? Um, we've been picking up uh, guests who have residences here with our chauffeurs. We've been delivering packages for our guests who are overseas to their friends who are here or so forth. So we've, this was kind of in the thinking already, but it's just very, ex it's accelerated all these thoughts we've been having for the past couple of years of how, you know, actually the world of a hotel is very, um, you can, all those elements we all have in our lives and actually we can be giving so much back to you in your lifestyle. And um, I think there's some very exciting things coming from Rosewood uh, for, the, for the rest of this year uh, where, you know, we will be um, really, um, you know, if you want us to be uh, much more in your lives other than just on that sort of hotel stay. Um, and, um, you know, and I think yeah. uh, that's really taught us some lessons about how our clients really appreciate either our services or our products or our opinions or our knowledge in destination and how we can sort yeah. of share that more. I mean, I, I can't think of anything more luxurious at the moment than someone cooking, changing your sheets making you a cocktail i mean honestly we've all been doing it to ourselves or for ourselves for too long now so yeah. you know yeah a wonderful concierge one i mean you know my own cocktail maker next door that would just be heaven uh, so i totally get that um before we end uh jillian are there some questions i can see that the chat and the q a has some things in there so is there anything um we covered a lot of them, but um, one that was asked um, is about fashion. Do we think that there will be, when we can finally get out of our loungewear and act at leisure, will there be um, people trying to embrace the frivolous and the flippant or more colors or um, do we see that as a trend? Yeah, I would definitely see that as a trend. I think as we were saying, there's sort of two sides of it. I think there will be one sort of strong pull towards that because we use fashion to express how we are feeling, what is going on, what we're excited about, what we're dreaming about or kind of longing for. And fashion is a way of showing that through color and styles. So I think there will be sort of a, a large majority who do sort of embrace that and sort of have fun that we've kind of been missing out on for the last year. So using fashion as a vehicle for that. So we may all just be really overdressed for a little bit for <laughs> doing the most simple thing, popping off to, you know, a non-essential shop in my full ball gown. Uh, 
Um, thank you so, so much to all of you this morning. It's uh, been a really interesting discussion. I'm delighted you could join us. Very privileged to have you all here. Um, I just want to say thank you as well to Cultural Communications who helped uh, bring this together and Gillian from La Parda who's been powering it all in the background. Um, and thank you to those of you who've joined us this morning as well. Um, see you next time and, and thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.